Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guest is professor of political science at the University of Florida and one of the foremost experts on American elections, Dr. Michael McDonald. Remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the links to our sponsors, Blinkist, Miracle Brand, and Chili Sleep in the show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, James, Raphael Warnock won the Georgia runoff, and while not unexpected, it is important, with a caveat or two. The Democrats now have a one-seat advantage in Senate committees. That matters. It just makes it easier to send confirmations to the floor, especially judges. It used to be, you know, 9 to 9 or 10 to 10. Uh, But understand, War Room listeners, it makes almost no difference on legislation because there's not going to be any legislation in the next session of Congress. Maybe slightly enhanced Democrats' leverage in appropriations, differences with the House. Uh, And secondly, it prevents one senator from blocking any nomination. uh, So that's advantageous. And I guess it helps. It it does help the Democrats in 2024 because they have a terrible map. They hold 23 of the 33 seats up, and that makes it slightly less terrible. And James, to be maudlin, it's insurance. If anything happens to any of the 10 Democratic senators from states with a Republican governor. So all in all, it's a good thing, uh, but let's not overstate the positives. I agree totally. One thing that caught my eye this morning is Josh Marshall on Talking Points Memo. Mm -hmm. He talked about television coverage of the election. The truth of the matter is, you you called me or you at an event, I looked, it was 8.23 my time, so it was 9.23 Eastern time. Yeah. You know, back person said, man, this thing looks close. I said, no, it's over. The whole political world knew this election was over at 9 o'clock. And David Wasserman says, I've seen enough. He has never been wrong. And it's true. Yeah, it, it, they, they stretch it out, and they have a, a lot of cross-talk back and forth. And, and I, you know, in the, the, of course, the betting markets, Warnock never went under 89 cents. So anybody in the betting, everybody in the betting markets knew that he that Warnock was going. Now, I guess in, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter if there's fifteen hundred people in America that know what's going to happen in the election, and and everybody else is sitting there a nervous wreck. Just like on election night in twenty twenty, at twelve thirty at night, I knew Biden was going to win, and I said so. But and I understand that. The the network doesn't want to call it until they absolutely sure. I mean, our friend Mike Tackett at AP didn't have it wrong. They they got to be exhausted. That's their nature. But there was a whole body of knowledge that existed two hours before any of the networks called the race. And I just think it's an interesting aspect of coverage of, of, of uh, elections in the U.S. No, I think you're right. And and we we sometimes have knocked the polls. The polls were dead on this time. I mean, they were I mean, every single poll showed uh, that I saw. So it showed Warnock at 51 or 52 uh, and uh, Walker at uh, at 48. So give the polls credit this one time. But I don't want to overstate the positives because the fact is an excellent, a superb candidate. Warnock, now a big figure in the Democratic Party, defeated the worst least qualified, scandal-ridden candidate in a year full of Republican rogues by three points. So we also want to know, as I look at it, it seems to me that turnout was down from the runoff in 2020. It wasn't the presidential election anymore. So I think we have to ask the question uh, of why was turnout? I don't know the answer to it, but black turnout seems to have been down considerably. And I think that's an important question for Democrats uh, to look at and to try to answer. The most important question for the Democratic Party is, why has black turnout? It hadn't been, it's been more like abysmal. I mean, it's not, it's Georgia, it's North Carolina, it, it's Milwaukee, it's Philadelphia, Cleveland. it's Florida, yeah. it's Cleveland. Yeah. And if we, if we don't, if we don't look at this, because we're not going to win many elections like that. It was 17 contributions, and, and, and the figure that, you want to look for 
is the contribution of the share. So of the 100 people voted, how many were black? Right. I, and th- this this is not coming in in a good way. And I, I, I know I'm ecstatic about Raphael Warnock winning re-election, and that's great. But but there's, there's something going on underneath here. And I don't think it's, you know, it, it certainly wasn't for lack of black candidates. That 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 we can scratch off. It, had, it could have something to do with some of these voter suppression laws, although it was bad, but it didn't have voter suppression laws. It was bad. No, it was bad in states. I mean, North Carolina and Wisconsin did not have voter suppression laws because the Democratic governor blocked them. Uh, and it was down there, too. You're absolutely right. And I don't uh, I, I think it's you're right. It's the most important thing the Democrats have to do in postmortems here. Uh, there there were more good Democratic candidates running for the Senate in 2022, I think, than ever before in the history of American elections. And Warnock is the only one that won. Terrific. You know, but, you, you know, if you, you just can't say this and not be worried about it. It's a yeah. problem. Well, one thing that uh, Democrats um, don't have to be worried about, but Republicans sure do, is Donald J. Trump. He had, I can't think of any live politician who has, on the surface at least, had a worse autumn uh, than Donald Trump. He lost court case after one court case after another. His company was convicted of fraud. Dems got his tax returns. Uh, his, his, his Mar-a-Lago investigation, uh, appeals court threw out to any attempt to block that. Special counsel is going after uh, his uh, block. At, you know, what did he do January 6th? He dined with neo-Nazis and white nationalists, and he wants to deep six the Constitution. Other than that, it was just a great fall for Donald J. And with Herschel Walker, arguably, the Republicans lost two or three Senate seats in the majority because Trump-backed losers won the primary. And James, as you have said often, he's going to be indicted probably multiple times. I don't think he's going to be the GOP nominee in 2024, but he still commands the support of maybe, I don't know what it is, a third uh, to 40, 45 percent of the party. And he can do a lot of damage over the next year. Well, it, it, you know, I had that race thing, but my slogan going forward is Jack Smith knows Jack shit. Let me tell you, this guy is real and you know, every time Trump's phone rings, it it it, it it's worse news. And so his thing about suspending the Constitution, and everything, he is under. If you want Schadenfreude, if if you think that that Donald Trump has caused pain in your life, and more importantly, pain in in the life of this country, and particularly pain for racial minorities or immigrants. You can utterly take joy. That is the single most miserable human being in the United States right now is Donald Trump. The walls are closing in on him. This is the pit and the pendulum. Okay. He he knows what's going on. He's lashing out. He can't sleep at night. He can't keep food down. And he he realizes he's he's a primitive survivalist. But he knows he's cornered now, and he's cornered. So he, he's like a rabid bull or a rabid dog. Absolutely. He really is. And, and he, I, I, I shouldn't do that. It's not the, the way to, in the Judeo-Christian Abrahamic tradition. You, you should not. You should love all of humans and all of humanity. But I, I, I got to tell you, I, sometimes I just sit there and think of how miserable he is. It, it makes me feel better. You can carve out an exception to humanity uh, in assessing Donald J. Trump uh, uh, because he's done it for so many people. Um, You you know, look, I I, I indicted uh, all these other problems. He still may well run in 2024 because that's all he has to do. Uh, He'll come up with another scam. I I said earlier, and I believe it, I don't think he'll get the nomination. But the way he maximizes his strength is in a multi-candidate field. And you will have at least one right wing opponent, probably Ron DeSantis. We'll see if he wears well. Uh, and you'll have at least uh, one or two, uh, you know, genuine conservatives, uh, sane conservatives, uh, Asa Hutchinson or Chris Christie, and maybe one or two others. In four or five person field, Donald Trump is going to win some primaries, James, whether he's yeah, in jail or not. It's, it's, as we pointed out before, a vast majority. Of that primary is the one to take off. Yeah. If he has a solid 40 percent and there are four people running, he could he he, he could run the table. I I, I think I, I really believe this. I'm not saying this 
He might be in a penitentiary by then. I guess the appeals, it did let him appeal. And yeah, you can't, you can't, the process takes a little bit longer, I think, than that. Not but he's that's certainly going to go Look, I think as often as the case, the central question as we look at this was framed today by the great Tom Etzel in the New York Times. And I just want to read this because it, it was, he so nailed it. He says, how in a matter of less than a decade can this once proud country have evolved to the point at which there is a serious debate over choosing a presidential candidate who is a lifelong opportunist, a pathological and malignant narcissist, a sociopath, a serial liar, a philander, a tax cheat who doesn't pay his bills, a man who socializes with Holocaust deniers, who has pardoned his criminal allies, who encouraged a violent insurrection, who behind a wall of bodyguards is a coward, and who without remorse continuously undermines American democracy. That's Donald J. Trump. You know what? I even feel better about the fact that he's so miserable now. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any hesitation. I'm not even, I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. I, 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 all I want is some in, internal stories about how he's lashing out everybody, how he's miserable, screaming, nervous, scared. I, 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 and I know all of that is going on. I know it oh, is. Oh, yeah. And, of course, he has no friends. Yeah, he only has a hangers-on who make try, try to get a piece of his scams. And uh, so there's no one who's going to go to him and level with him because you can't. Uh, at least, you know, one one of his kids seems to have deserted him. And uh, it's just uh, – it's. Every day is bad. There hadn't been one bit of bright day, bright sunshine for Donald Trump. I, I'm going to dispute the word bad. Every day has been catastrophic. It has been. I stand corrected. <laughs> All right. And you know, James, the holidays are here, and it's the perfect time to dive into the things you've wanted to explore all year. Nothing is better for that than Blinkist. Blinkist helps you to discover and understand key insights and powerful ideas from books and podcasts in record time with blinks and shortcasts. Imagine discovering new perspectives, having exciting conversations, and finding those aha moments you've been looking for. Blinkist offers the best selection of nonfiction books and podcasts condensed down to 15 minutes for immediate inspiration and mastery. They offer over 5,500 titles in 27 categories in their unique, entertaining, and engaging audio format. It's perfect no matter where you are or what you're doing, whether it's for education or pleasure. Now, not only is Blinkist easy and enjoyable to use, you can even listen and read at the same time by downloading titles for offline access while celebrating their 10-year anniversary Blinkist launched a totally new function. It's going to be your favorite ever. Think of all those great ideas you naturally want to share and discuss with others instead of just keeping them to yourself. Blinkist Connect does just that. Blinkist Connect allows all premium users to share your account with another person of your choice so you effectively get two premium accounts for the price of one at zero cost. That's a heck of a deal. That way, you can easily share blinks and shortcasts with each other with just one click. James and I would love to share the best ones. And, you know, recently, you could have gotten the fascinating history from, this is really fascinating, from When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt by Cara Cooney from the Dan Snow Picks playlist. And it's amazing to read about the women called to lead one of the most interesting empires in the historical record, even if it does make some of us wish we had elected Hillary Clinton instead of that other guy. But you can learn more about any topic you can think of with Blinkist. And James, we keep saying how much we love this, and we want to get these architects of this thing on this show sometime. I absolutely want to do that. I want to know how they do this. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's a trade secret and they don't want to tell us. I understand that. But I've, I've read off a little bit. I, I think it's a, uh, based in Berlin. But they, I, I guarantee you, I'd like to know who reads this and do they digest it and the, the whole thing. Because it, in, I've read some of the stuff on Blinkist that I knew something about previously. I'd read the, the longer form of the book or something like that. And i got to tell you, it, it's really good. <laughs> it's, it, it's like stunningly good. And I just yeah. want to pull this off. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash War Room 
to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off of a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash War Room to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Again, Blinkist.com slash War Room. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account so you get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Also, can look for the link in our show notes. James Michael McDonald, the University of Florida political scientist, runs the U.S. Election Project's data website. No one knows more about voting patterns in America. He's just published a book a couple months ago from the pandemic to the insurrection analysis of the 2020 vote. Michael, welcome back uh, to this podcast. You're one of our favorite guests. We'll get to your book in 2020 in, in a moment, but first, you follow this so closely. Let me ask you about 2022. I was appropriately chastised last week by con- by Congressman Gallego when I cited exit poll data on Hispanic voting. Uh, you are far more reliable than exit polls. Am I right that there was a relatively high turnout in 2022 midterms, but it was down from 2018. Can you give us a little bit of the what, whys, and where's as you analyze it now? Yeah, well, first of all, we just came off of historic highs for turnout rates in 2018 and 2020. You had right. to go back a century to see turnout rates that high. So in that context, yeah, turnout rates came down some from the 2018 uh, election, um, but they're still at a high level um, if you put aside that 2018 election, you'd still have to go back to the 1950s and 1960s to see a turnout rate as high as what we just saw in the 2022 election. So, yeah, turnout was pretty good for a modern midterm election. Mm-hmm. It was a disappointing outcome for the for the GOP, but I think it's right. They got more votes. Um, so I guess the question is, how did that, uh, you know, how did that break down? How did independence um, uh perform in this election. Can you analyze that yet, Michael? Well, you know, and that's where we have to look at exit poll data and other survey data to uh, parse that information. And um, so it's not really what I do too much, but we do know that uh, by and large, in terms of turnout patterns across the country, where we saw the Democrats pick up seats or at least maintain their advantage within the Senate, um, that had to do with higher turnout. There were people engaged there. Democrats were clearly winning over some independents in those particular states where we had the really hot contests that were going on. And I said it tongue in cheek uh, a couple of weeks ago. I said the Democrats need to pretend like Herschel Walker's on the ballot everywhere because uh, they need to have their their voters show up in places like California and New York, where uh, they were not threatened by uh, abortion being taken away, uh, you know, their rights taken away. And so um, in places where uh, Democrats uh, lost the House, I believe by and large, that's because they didn't see that motivation to show up to vote for those House candidates. And it's just hard to break through uh, to voters to say that House candidate is it's really important for you to participate and vote in that election. And I, I, that's where I think that where the Democrats might have lost. Now, in terms of Hispanic voters, yeah, actually, the um, Democrats did fairly well in places where they needed them to do that, with places like Nevada and Arizona. So uh, maybe that big shift that people had said happened in 2020 to the, the um, Republican Party, uh, it's not seeming to actually play out in practice. Maybe that was just a one off aberration that had something to do with Trump. James and I were talking earlier that the black vote seems to have been down as a share, almost everywhere, Georgia, North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, you know, elsewhere. That that should be a, a long-term concern for Democrats. Conversely, at least anecdotally, it appears the youth vote was better than expected. Do you have any sense of why the black vote has been, has been dropping or why they did better among the youth vote this time? Uh, yeah, that is definitely a concern, and it's likely that the Democrats lost an opportunity in Wisconsin uh, because African Americans in Milwaukee didn't show up to vote. Right. Um, and when I was looking at the numbers, uh, I was saying, "Man, is there like a reporting error on election night?" When we were 
that because I work at the exit poll organization and we were processing the data as it there's got to be like an error. Like there got to be like 40,000 more votes coming out of Milwaukee. And um, uh, they had to call up the local election official three times that night uh, to confirm like, no, that's the real number. That's the number that we got. That's not a, a reporting error that's coming out of Milwaukee. So it's very clear that that was um, uh, you know, a phenomenon that was happening. And it wasn't just there. You saw it in Philadelphia, uh, uh, Detroit and other places. Um, fortunately, the uh, Democrats didn't need to rely on those votes in places like Pennsylvania in order to carry the seat. But it is a concern. Now, again, what could be really going on here is that um, whatever was motivating people to vote um, in a midterm election wasn't really motivating them uh, the same way for among all different racial groups. And you could see this in lower turnout uh, in communities of color, not just among the African-American community, but other communities as well. And so it, it could be that that's what's at play here is that, um, you know, and, and just face it, I mean, I, it's hard to motivate people to vote uh, in midterm elections. It's easier to do it in presidential. Um, you need a better message. Um, what is the message that you're going to need to do to break through and get those people to show up to vote? Yeah. James Carville. All right, so, uh, Prof, I, I I don't want to leave this question because I think it, I think it's a central question for the Democratic Party, and that is the, the issue of black turnout. And I, I publicly am going to continue to urge the party to to do some research to see what happened, why it happened, and how it can be rectified. Um, and it was it was it was in Georgia. It was a 26.2 share in November, which is the lowest we've had since 2006. So, I mean, 2006 was a long time ago. And, you know, we're, we're in to much more chronic high turnout elections. If, if they came to you and you said, OK, you set up the project, how, how where would you look or how would you set up a research project to find out why we have abysmal low turnout in the black community? And what can we do? And I admit that we can only speculate now, but how would you set up that project? Well, again, if I, if I were to speculate, just looking right. back. That's, all, that's what um, we do. Inflation was, was really hurting people with lower income levels. Right. And, um, you know, as much as that some of the white collar issues like abortion matter um, it, it and loan forgiveness, uh, for young people, that doesn't break through in the same way to people who are hurting in their pocketbooks. And so um, I, I think on balance, that's probably what was going on. The, the, they didn't particularly like, African-Americans didn't particularly like um, the, the you know, Walker as a, as a choice. Um, but at the same time, they weren't really enthused because they, they were feeling some pain. And uh, they didn't want to participate. Uh, you know, they didn't really see a big choice. It was the lesser of two evils that they were voting for. Um, so that would be my guess. How do you actually study it and figure out how to do it? Um, that's not what I do, <laughs> but I do know the people who do that sort of stuff. And and they would tell you, you know, you got to do your message testing. Um, uh, you got to get your focus groups together. You got to do randomized. I, and, you know, that stuff's been mined out fairly well at this point. Um, I think, you know, look, if you want to affect things in the big way, it's those transformational candidates like Obama um, that really uh, inspire people to participate when they may not otherwise want to. And I look here like in Florida, Martin Frost, um, the youngest member of Congress, um, he's really dynamic. Uh, and so you need more people like him. And they need to be carrying a message and they need to be communicating with their communities. Um, and and it's and it's people like him and other activists across the country uh, that that really need to be empowered here. But again, that's just like platitudes. And I don't know what the answer is. I'm not from the community. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't I don't have the answer. And I don't you know, no one obviously does. Uh, you know, but Mandela Barnes was young, dynamic, African-American lieutenant governor of Wisconsin, Stacey Abrams and most celebrated maybe black female of the modern era, you know, or two in uh, uh, Val Demings, you know, and, and Val's a, a very personable, you know, solid candidate. Uh, the, Sherry Beasley, who I, 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 I campaigned for, really liked the thoughts. You know, I, I, I'll give you my, uh, my, my, my thought. I think the Democrats' unwillingness to talk about crime just signals something to them that, that they don't understand what's going on in their life. I mean, the pupils have 
But, you know, American blacks, 81 percent think that violence in their community is a big issue. And when you abdicate your, your messaging to the academic and identity left, you're going to get a predictable result. But I don't know that that's the case, but that, that, I think that may be a culprit. Well, I agree with you about that. I mean, I think the wrong people are the people who are trying to figure out what the message is. Um, and uh, and so maybe we need more voices from the actual communities uh, contributing to uh, to what that message needs to be. Uh, and uh, again, some academic or, you know, and, and we're trying to do our best to, to increase diversity in academia. So, uh, you know, we're trying, but we're not there yet. And the elite consultants are not really coming from those communities either. So um, it may be that we're just not listening to the right voices and they're the, the, the not the people who are uh, really working, you know, helping with the message strategy. And, and I think that goes with the Hispanic community too. Um, because, uh, you know, Democrats have in some ways failed uh, with, you know, especially here in Florida and South Florida uh, with the Hispanic community and uh, ceded uh, that community to the Republicans. And uh, and we need, you know, Democrats just need to do better. So before I turn it over to Al, uh, Jim Gerstein, who, who is a good friend of this show and a good friend of Al and I, he does probably more house polling than anybody in the country. Uh, and I, I you know, he, he said something I thought was pretty insightful about the Hispanic vote. He did a lot of work in Nevada and Arizona. He, he thinks that Dobbs really helped hold a Hispanic vote with, with Hispanic women. That 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 sort of stop helped stop the erosion. And there's no way to prove that, but it, it it seems like a pretty astute observation to me. Yeah, I, it could have. I we're collecting the data on that now to try to figure out what went on, not from the polling, but from the precinct level data that, uh, um, so we're, we're gonna be looking at this to try to figure out what happened. Um, and it could, you could be right. It could be that uh, um, we're gonna see some patterns that uh, suggest that there was resilience in certain communities that, um, you know, the polls, and you shouldn't use the exit polls for this, by the way, uh, as much as I love them and I work for them and everything else, the, uh, the they're just not designed to get at um, the opinions of subgroups and their demographic profile and everything else. So it's going to be other means of, of doing other surveys and, and other uh, field work that's really going to reveal the answer to some of these questions. Robert? Um, let's get to your book, your comprehensive look at the 2020 election concluded, as others have, that there was no real fraud. You know, I got to tell you, Michael, I hate it when I hear people say there was no widespread fraud that would have uh, changed the outcome. God damn it, there was infinitesimal fraud, almost none. I mean, probably less fraud than there is in Amazon. Uh, and uh, it's, it didn't affect the outcome of a single federal election. Maybe we just have to come up with better rhetoric, better rhetoric saying there was no widespread fraud, fraud so overstates the case. I mean, don't you agree that it was, it was barely measurable? Well, I agree with that. I mean, and even... Uh, Trump's own Department of Homeland Security uh, said this, and right. uh, Bill Barr said it, and uh, you know all these Republican elected officials, Secretary of State's uh, governors, they all said it too. I, it, you know, so it was only one person that was honking on this, and he manages to convince everybody else of what's going on, at least within his own party. Um, and so, uh, but you know, so why do we use that language, or at least why do I use it? Because we've been criticized so much for saying that there's no fraud. Uh, and, you know, you can put it on one hand and count it. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of fraud in there. Um, but if you say that there's no fraud, then every instance of fraud is thrown back in your face to say, oh, no, 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 look, you're 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 completely missing this case here, this one person who committed fraud. And, uh, you know, it's a rhetorical game that we have to play back and is, forth yeah. uh, with the groups. And and look, those people and I document this in the book and it, um, it, those people who make those arguments that there's wide, the widespread fraud, the people who, who build up that those evidence, and sometimes it's very questionable of the evidence that they're building their house on, um, they uh, 
um, they were part of all of this. <laughs> I mean, they they were whispering into Trump's ears about this, it, and he was a willing recipient of that information because he didn't want to hear how he lost the 2016 election in the popular vote. I mean, he couldn't have done that because he's Trump, and and so he was just this willing vessel to hear this message. And and there were people that that served on that voter integrity commission. Um, and and other things that uh, really set the stage for what was going to happen in the 2020 election itself. Yeah, and they came up with nothing, of course. Um, you know, they they also rail uh, or did rail against mail ballots. And I, M- Michael, tell me if I'm right that they are no less, uh, or they are just as secure as voting in person. You know, I, I'm old enough to, I remember when they used to favor the GOP. In your state of Florida, about 30 years ago, uh, Republican Connie Mack lost the Senate seat in Election Day and then squeaked ahead when the absentees came in. I mean, didn't Donald Trump, among his other sins, isn't his diatribe against voting by mail, didn't it really screw Republicans? Oh, yeah. I mean, it screwed his own campaign because they spent tens of millions of dollars trying to promote uh, his supporters to vote by mail. And uh, and then the candidate blurts out, uh, no, don't. It's all fraudulent. So, I mean, even the campaign put out these like mailers uh, or the the state parties did really uh, uh, that were blurring out his tweets that were, uh, you know, trying to make it suggestive that he really supported uh, uh, voting by mail, you know, and, and trying to, to trick people into thinking that. So, um, it, yeah, it's, it's incredible. But I, you know, it's really funny that's happening right now. In the last 24 hours or so, you're starting to see, uh, Republicans like Newt Gingrich and Ron McDon, uh, Ron, Mc, Ron Daniels, uh, uh, saying that, uh, Ronald Romney McDaniel. Yeah, Romney yeah, McDaniel. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, they're saying, no, we need to get our people voting by mail and voting in person early. <laughs> so, I, I mean, maybe that's Trump's influence finally waning. Is I mean, yeah. you know, seriously, maybe that's, uh, you know, some of the, the cracks are starting to show where um, people are willing to abandon Trump and, and his rhetoric of fraud um, and start saying, you know what, we need to win elections. I mean, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. And we're going to do it by ever which way possible. And one other thing about this is, look, um, part of the Republican victories in the House of Representatives were in congressional districts out in California, which run an all-male ballot election. So there's no reason why Republicans can't run effective elections if there are a large number of mail ballots. Let me talk about one of their other voting suppression measures, which is drop boxes. And in states, Republicans control and counties, they are either uh, eliminating them or eliminating them. Well, I, I would seem to me that drop boxes are maybe the best and easiest way to vote. And, and, and the most secure. secure. Yeah, the most secure. Like, I, so, again, there's another drop box that's out there that no one talks about. It's called the mailbox. And, uh, you know, if you were trying to, like, fraudulently return uh, mail ballots, why would you do it in front of a television uh, camera uh, and, and where, you know, it could be monitored? No, you'd, like, throw it into the mailbox. And uh, but, the, you know, that's the, the, the joke way of looking at this. But more seriously, look, when you put a, a ballot into the mailbox, it's got to go through more hands to get to you. It's got to travel a further distance when it goes into a drop box. Uh, the election officials get that and it goes directly into the election officials hands. There's no middleman of having a postal delivery person, more than one, hand your mail, your mail ballots. And again, we know from the 2020 election, and I document this, there were instances where there were ballots that were sitting in post offices that were undelivered uh, because of um, uh mistakes that were being made at post offices. So again, if you want to get the ballots most directly into voters' hands, I mean, into election officials' hands, you want to use the drop boxes because yes. that's the most secure yes. way of doing it. Yeah. Let, let me just try one more because these are the talking points you're hearing from Republicans. Mike Pence, who's not an election denier, but he says, hey, you know, there were real irregularities. And I think you've got this. He cites the Wisconsin State Supreme Court declaring there were violations of election laws in two instances, and says the U.S. Supreme Court sequestered votes in Pennsylvania that came in after the deadline. Are you familiar with either of those cases? Yeah, and neither of those changed the election outcome. But, mm-hmm. you know, there, there is one thing, and because 
as today, as we're having this conversation, there are these oral arguments going on at the U.S. Supreme Court right. uh, in the Moore v. Harper case, which is this independent state legislature's theory. Um, during the uh, presidential election in Pennsylvania, um, there was a case where the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, at least considered uh, this independent state legislature's theory. Now it was the case was appealed and it was um, was not taken up by the Supreme Court, so um, there was not action taken on it. But one of the bases for Republicans' objections to the Pennsylvania vote during the certification on January sixth was about this. And so, um, yes, it was probably bad optics for them to you know, be denying you know, voting against the certification in Pennsylvania. But I will at least give them this much credit that there was a principled reason for it. It may not be the winning reason at the U.S. Supreme Court, but there was let a me, let me, reason for Let like, me quibble. You know, you'll forget more than I know. These were, I think, 10,000 ballots right. that they said that, that were postmarked by Election Day, and they had mail problems, clear mail problems there. And they said if they're postmarked by Election Day, we'll count them. Uh, 10,000 ballots, Biden run the state by 80,000. So even if every single one of them had gone to Trump, it A, made no difference. And in the middle of a pandemic, why wasn't that just totally justified? Well, you know, again, those ballots were set aside. There was, yeah. and there was all the legal ballots, but that that that's the one decision um, that Mark Elias lost at it when he says, like, I won 64, 63. No, 64. Michael, it's I'm sorry. One. Seth Waxman and Walter Dellinger and Don Verrilli won those cases. Mark well, Elias, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Mark Elias didn't have a one. goddamn thing to do with him. He claims credit for him. But what James and I know it was it was our dear friend, the late Walter and Seth Waxman and Don Verrilli that won those cases. We'd have to go off record, I think, and, and talk about, you know, what goes on with uh, all the the things on the grandstanding on the lawyers. But uh, well, anyway, this is the one case. Uh, not grandstanding. This is the one case, and it was at a district court level. It was never formally appealed, and um, it was all mooted out anyways. No one bothered to litigate it any further because, um, uh, you know, the, it was clear that Biden had won. So it was just like, why yeah. why continue a case on 10,000 ballots that aren't going to make a, a bit of difference? If yeah. they had mattered, it probably would have been appealed. And who knows? Maybe the courts would have found um, a valid validity in which you, your argument there is that they really should have counted. James. So, so let's have a hypothet, Professor. But I'm the campaign manager and you're you're the chief quant in the campaign. And we'll both assume for the moment, I don't think either of us are, we're, we're totally amoral people. And all we want to do is win, right? So somebody comes in and says, look, I got this guy. If you give me ten grand, I can. We can get five hundred stuff ballots, mail ballots. And somebody says, "Look, this guy can really do it." So he leaves, and you know, so it's going to be a million people votes, five hundred ballots. Now, the, the reward is we get five hundred votes that we don't deserve. The risk is you're going to go to jail forever if you get caught. I don't think there is a higher risk law reward crime in the United States than election fraud. I mean, it utterly makes no sense. If you just take everything out, what you're risking for such a little thing, it's, it's absurd. And, and yet it happens. I mean, it does happen in some cases, like that North Carolina um, uh, and that, uh, instance that, that, in, that, for the primary. Outside of, uh, of, of know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan Robeson uh, County. And so... Um, so it does happen. It happened in a um, Miami mayoral primary, um, and you can find other instances. When it does happen, though, it's not happening in statewide elections because that 500 vote, they're just, it, if you're 500 votes, <laughs> you know, that's incredibly <laughs> close election. But where does it matter? It matters like in a primary election where turnout's really low and uh, maybe it's a local election. That's where we see this type of fraud. And again, this is why I have to say, yeah, there was no widespread fraud. Yeah, we know that it happens in some loca isolated instances, but it certainly did not happen in any statewide election in any recent memory. Right. It, it, it is the, the highest risk, low reward crime in the United States. 
Yeah, look at if I go rob a bank, at least I got a shot to walk out with a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, and, and look how the idiots who were in uh, J six walking around the Capitol taking selfies of themselves. There's no way to keep this secret in today's world. People are dumb, and people are going to take selfies of themselves doing illegal things. And so you you do your thing where you're going to get the five hundred ballots. It's going to get out there. Someone's going to see it and you're going to get caught. So it's just not even worth the effort of getting caught um, because, you know, it's going to happen. Right. Well, uh, you you know, what when you what is it catalyst or when you do your research, what's the most reliable place that gives you election? what, What data that you can analyze that you have faith in? Oh, well, I mean, there's different sources, and and this is where you actually need to look at all the different sources, and you need to bring all that information together. I have a a big beef with people like Nate Silver and others about uh, the value of early voting and its ability to forecast um, what's going to happen in the election versus the polls. And um, and there's well, a right, look at it. You have early voting. Let's just let this slip by. Just, what does Nate say and what do you say? Oh, yeah. He says, just don't even look at it. It's, it's completely worthless information. Right. And uh, and I, my take on it and I, I've got a fairly good track record is you, it's some there are some indications there about enthusiasm that you can see from the early vote. You can look to a past election. You can make a comparison is are more Democrats voting than they did in last election um, early. Uh, and, you know, so are we seeing some aberration patterns? And I, I just did that with the Georgia runoff election and correctly predicted that Warnock was going to win in a very close election. But I predicted that he was, was going to win. And I did that on Sunday um, before the election. And so um, you, you can use this information and but you need to look at it as a holistic whole because all data have their strengths and their weaknesses. And so you want to look at the polling numbers. You want to look at the early voting data. You want to think about other things that are going on. Uh, you want to look at the whole thing and try to come to a reasoned solution as what you think is going to happen. And that, and that answers your question as well, because, yeah, I want to look at voter file data from the voter file vendors. Um, I want to look at polling data that's going to be available. I want to look at the precinct level election results. And I want to look at all of these from different angles and see, are they telling me consistent signals about how the election, uh, what happened in the election? And if so, then I have stronger confidence that, yeah, that, that was a true signal about what's happening. If they're in conflict, then I want to know, well, what's going on here? What's Why is this telling me something different this data source telling me something different from this over here and uh, and then try to understand the strengths and weaknesses and get a, at a better understanding of, of what may really be going on. And you may have missed something from just one signal if you just relied on that one data source. Excellent. Right, that answers my question to the nth degree. Albert? <laughs> well, okay, well, I'm an listen. academic, so I do that sort of stuff. <laughs> well, you're 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 an academic and also you're a great election expert and analyst. Uh, your book, uh, every, I want you all out there to get it. It's from the pandemic to the insurrection. If you really want to know what happened in 2020 and what did not happen. Michael, let me see if I can get one compromise amendment. We won't talk about widespread. We won't talk about none. We'll talk about infinitesimal. How about that? That's fine. You know, and, and while we're talking about the book, I, I, it does bear to say at this point that, look, um, our election officials did a tremendous amount of work. And I and the book is really dedicated to them and the people who voted as well. Uh, there were people who died so that our democracy could continue. Um, they were election officials who were exposed to COVID and died. And we know that. We have documented evidence that that happened. And, um, and look, by and large, the Democratic states tried to make it easier for people to vote by mail to pe- keep people safe. But there were some Republicans out there in the Trump campaign in particular that didn't do that. And we unnecessarily exposed people and their families and their loved ones and their friends to uh, harm, all for a political reason. And, um, you know, we we need to thank our, our election officials. We need to thank the voters who also kept, you know, went out and vote at levels that we haven't seen since 1900. Um, it was a, a triumph for the United States that that happened. Um, but it's also a tragedy at the same time that people had to sacrifice, make the ultimate sacrifice 
so that we could continue to have a democracy. Well, well said, uh, Michael McDonald, and I hope you all will get the book. And Michael, at some point when you think you have analyzed 2022 when more data comes in, uh, we'd like to have you back, okay? Absolutely. I'd love to be back. Terrific. Michael McDonald, University of Florida, our favorite Gator. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) You know, winter is here. For us, that means struggling to find the right temperature when we sleep. But we've recently found a way to stay at the perfect temperature all night long using silver infused bed sheets by Miracle Brand. These were inspired by NASA. Using silver infused fabrics, Miracle Brand makes temperature regulating bedding so you can always sleep in comfort. And since we started using Miracle Brand self cooling bed sheets, we stay comfortable every night, all night. Thanks to Miracle Brand's thermoregulating sheets, unique self-cooling properties. Now, even better, they're self-cleaning. Thanks to their infusion of natural silver that prevents 99.9% of bacterial growth. They stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. So forget those gross odors. Their design makes them much better for your skin with less bacteria to clog your pores. And that means fewer breakouts and other skin problems. Magic sheets are also luxuriously comfortable without the high price tags of other luxury brands. Their sheets use a premium 500 thread count sateen weave that's made with USA growth Sapima cotton, one of the highest quality cottons in the world. That makes Miracle Sheets the perfect gift for your spouse, friends, or family. Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. So keep cleaner, sleep cleaner, and more comfortably in luxury with Miracle Brand Sheets. They're perfect, and James, we love a great night's sleep. Oh, do we love a great night's sleep? And cotton is something I know a little bit about, and that team of cotton, that's some expensive stuff. And the difference between wearing a shirt with the regular thread count cotton and Pima uh-huh. cotton, it's all the difference in the world. And I, my skin, and this stuff is very, and my skin, I have very irritable skin. I can't, it's it hard for me to wear certain fabrics. But Pima cotton is, is is unbelievably good cotton. And to get that on a sheet is, 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 a, is, a, is a real treat. I mean, a real, real treat. The difference between a, a Pima cotton and the regular stuff you get is all the difference in the world. It's a great product. Well, that's, yeah. So go to trymiracle.com slash war room to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. We got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% and be sure to use our promo code war room at checkout. That's war room to save even more and get three free towels. And Miracle is so confident in their product. It's back with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom to treat yourself, a friend, or loved ones this holiday season. You also can find the link in our show notes. Thank you, Miracle Brand, for sponsoring this episode. Okay, now, James, we're going to go to our listener questions because they're always so good. And again, making the choices of which ones to use is the most difficult task I have. Uh, the first, though, is from Tom. And let me, I hope I get this right. It, it's Owatonna, Minnesota. O W A T O N N A. It looks like Owatonna. And he says 33 seats up in 2024. Democrats have to defend 21, really 23. Seems to me seven or more could be at risk. Republicans have 10 to defend, almost none at risk. Uh, so I'm in this context. Tom is interested in the strategy for Democrats' presidential uh, selection, uh, Biden at the head of the ticket, and its impact on maintaining Senate control. Wow. Well, you asked the money question. OK, this is this is what's going through everybody's mind. And a lot of there's a lot of vulnerable Democratic incumbents. 
All right, look, you know, sent to Casey, sent to Manchin, who decides to run, sent to Tester, you go on down the list. And the only way, the only way that the Democrats would hold the Senate in this environment is to have an energized party and a decisive presidential win. And the question that every Democrat should be asking is, we love Joe Biden. We are amazed at things that he's been able to accomplish. Is he going to be in a position to rally the party, deliver a big win, and have this? And I I know that question is going through every Democratic senator's mind. And it's one of the things that I hope the president considers uh, when he and Mrs. Biden are making the decision about their future. But it's a very... Very. And look, he could say, look, James, though, he could say, look, you know, if I don't run, it's going to be a wide open thing. It's going to be messy and you never know what's going to happen. But they are, that, that may or may not be true. But I, I think the Senate and the House and not just that, but, you know, all the way, you know, courthouse to the state house to the White House and all that shit they say is going to have a big bearing on how we do in the presidential election. So it's it's a factor that needs to be brought up and it's a factor that needs to be considered. Yeah, yeah, no, it sure does. Um, John in Chicago says 2022 has seen a global failure of authoritarian leaders such as Putin, Xi, Rainey, even Trump, although he was voted out of of office. They've all failed because of their self-inflicted wounds. How can the world capitalize on their failures and advance the goal uh, of a free world, which had been in decline? You know, John, you're on to something. I, last night at a really interesting event, was talking to Ken and Carol Edelman, who are very active in Freedom House. We had Michael Abramowitz on once, and this is a nonpartisan group started by Eleanor Roosevelt and um, um, uh, Wendell Wilkie that really champions freedom around the world. I think six months, a year ago, there was greater concern there than there is today. Shouldn't let up. There's still concern. But John's right about some of the failures. And uh, I think another thing that I would point out was was election deniers, by and large, lost uh, in the American elections. Putin has shown himself to be a, a, a deeply flawed leader. Uh, so I, I don't want to exaggerate it. But I think, by and large, if you look at the end of 2022, um, freedom, democracy is in a little bit better shape than it was at the start. Well, the, uh, of course, I'm part of the, a foreign policy person, but I, I really think we should get someone on the show after the first of the year, talk about China and, and what it is. And, and we, we love the book by Graham Allison. And the thesis was, and I'm sure it was right at the time, that China is an ascendant power. Right. That's not true anymore. China's, a, you know, not... It's still a very powerful country, don't get me wrong. So huge GDP, huge population. But but they're like descending. They're not, they're not the same as they were two years ago. And it did, are they more dangerous being ascendant or descending? Same is true with Russia. I mean, they've exposed themselves to be not very much. I mean, they're getting the crap kicked out of them by Ukraine. And, you know, their economies for shit. But it, it, it's a little bit troubling, too, because you, you, as they go down, the quick way to rally the, the troops is to start a freaking war. So I, the question is well taken. I think it's one that we should explore uh, after the first of the year. I think it would be well worth it because when these autocratic models start not working very well, what they do is they become more autocratic. The same is true as Iran. Be, be, be sure you put Iran in there because mm-hmm. they have a wonderful population and a, a really, really shitty authoritarian, near totalitarian state. And, you know, they're having trouble with what happens. People demonstrate and the reaction of the mullahs is to crack down harder. Right. No, and you're, you're, you're we, absolutely right. You have to um, explore this question. This is too important. Yeah, it sure is. Sean in San Diego, California, says much hay is made about trying to bridge the gap for Democrats and eke out a 51-49 victory in places like North Carolina. Sean says, why not set your sights higher by focusing on 80-20 issues like basic abortion rights, protecting Social Security, gay marriage, and so on? Take no position that polls uh, polls at less than 60 percent 
with the Republicans taking the 20 percent side of most of these issues, I, Sean thinks it's a real opportunity for the Democrats if they do it right. Now, James, I think you've been on top of this early. If I could, I'd jump to this computer and kiss this guy. OK, I, I don't I don't know that he wants that. I probably doesn't. But sometimes you have to use poetic license to say, <laughs> man, I so agree with you. I can't even tell you. And, and we talked about this earlier, but in, about the referendum, about the referendum 221 in Arizona and the dark money. Right. Also, the referendum in Arizona about people who are not citizens, citizens of Arizona paying in-state tuition at Arizona right. University. This passed popular. Then I read about, I don't know how I didn't hear about this before, in New Mexico, they put a state-provided free daycare proposal on the ballot. It got 70%. 70%. And so it, the minimum wage got two-thirds in Florida. Allowing felons the right to vote got two-thirds in Florida. We got so many issues out there. The Medicaid we, expansion uh, passes in South Dakota and in Oklahoma. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Exactly. And, and, and these sons of bitches want to talk about pronouns or defund the police or, or any of this other stuff. Oh, my God. We, the, the, the public agrees with us. This is not a center right nation anymore. It's a center left nation. Understand that. In, in in what you say, and, and they agree with us on Dobbs, they agree with us on climate, they agree with us on guns. All right. Take the single, what you need to do is pick out the five most popular things that you're for that they don't like and run on that. And nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing else. And this guy is exactly right. In the problem with the party, people, a lot of Democrats, that they, they want to be too goddamn smart. You know, if you if you don't address the systemic problem now, you, if you want to address the systemic problem, get elected. Because if you elect more Democrats, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have more voting rights. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have expanded and better health care. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have better schools and better opportunity. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have a country that is more willing and accepting of immigrants. People like immigrants. They like immigrations. They don't like disorder. Yeah. Und get that through you. They're not you. You, you the thing. That is, take these left-wing Democrats and just beat it in their stupid, vapid heads that we want to run on popular things so we can acquire power and do great things. Sean, we love your question. And don't worry, we're not going to kiss you, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Bill in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. Said ranked choice voting enabled the defeat of Sarah Palin and the victory of Lisa Murkowski. Uh, Bill says, have you changed your mind on it yet? I, I was I frankly have been kind of favorably disposed to it uh, all along as we learn more about it. First of all, it doesn't uh, you know, it, it really doesn't uh, factor in in a lot of places. But what I think when it when it is used, what it does is it, it makes it harder for the extremes of either party to win because. If it's a multi-candidate field in a primary or general election, uh, the person who can squeeze out, I don't know, 39 percent can sometimes win, even though, you know, 55 uh, percent don't like uh, uh, like that person. So I, I'm really attracted to ranked choice voting. I don't want to exaggerate uh, what it's going to do to change American politics. But I think so far, every place I've seen it, New York City, Maine, Alaska, um, I think it works. Yeah, I, I'm. You know, my initial reaction: well, What's wrong with the person with the most votes winning? All right, and and what they say is is that if you don't have this, it, 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 there's some evidence that that's true. I, I, I would describe myself as I, I have an open mind about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 an open mind, leaning leaning favorable. Uh, next, Don in Chesterfield, Missouri. Who uh, yes, this is a good question. Has any study been done on who died from COVID? in the United States and how that affected the elections in 20 and 2022. 20, Don't you assess probably that more Republicans die due to not getting vaxxed? He's exactly right. And there's a lot of exhaustive stuff. There was a, a really exhaustive study in, in, I think I understand this. I'm, I'm, I'm hardly a, a public health uh, uh, person, but the, what you want to look at is excess deaths. 
All right. Because you're not sure who died from COVID or died from something else. Right. And they are pretty good to say in, in, in the state of Louisiana, uh, in, in the coming calendar year, we're going to have X number of deaths. And, and they're, they're pretty accurate. And if you took the states and ranked them with excess deaths, you could pick the top 10, 80 percent of the top 10 states. And you could pick 90 percent of the bottom 10 states. I mean, it's just exactly what you think it is. Right. Of course, this data is going to do nothing, but they're going to, you know, this will be the most studied thing in, in maybe in history by the time it's over when they dissect everything and they know more. So the question is really good. And uh, it, it could have cost them some elections. It, 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 it is possible that, that with, you know, without this, and somebody did a study, if it wouldn't have been for Stalin's, you know, murdering everybody in World War II, the population of Russia, instead of being 150 million, would be 350 million a day. I mean, it, it, it has consequences that echo out. But the question, man, these questions today, this might be the best question today we've ever had. Boy, yeah. And it's not stopping, James. We got a couple more. We, you know, Mark in San Francisco says, is Hakeem Jeffries the right choice to take over for Pelosi? I love the age and wisdom of you, James, and even me, and of course, Nancy. But is this an opportunity to bring in some young blood? Yes, it is. And the Democratic Party clearly needs young blood. And it was time for a change. Uh, and I think Hakeem Jeffries shows promise. <clears throat> I will say this. Uh, uh, you'd always rather be in the majority, but for his leadership and honing his leadership skills, it's an advantage to be where he is. He doesn't have to deliver the way Pelosi did uh, 218 votes with only 221 or 22 members. Uh, congressional leadership is different. It's really hard. She was a magician. She was the best I have ever seen. You have to have a combination of charm, of toughness, of great instincts, of knowing who to reach out to and, uh, uh, you know, who to who to pressure and who to cajole, and as I said, who to charm. She was the best. Hakeem Jeffries can grow into the job, and I think it's easier that he's going to get a two-year run in the minority, at least, and uh, even though he'd rather be in the majority. Yeah, I, I, I also, uh, Nancy Lowe's a great skill. She knew who and how to castrate people, and everybody knew that, and she was feared. You cannot lead anything without the element of fear. That 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 is a a, a total one hundred percent fact. And, and I would use this as a springboard. But there's a phenomenon called voyeurism. You know, but I don't, I don't need to go into great detail. Everybody in the show knows what it is. One of my great treats is watching them cut quarter savage Kevin McCarthy. He he, they, they got him going every which way you can go. And he's so weak and he's so pathetic and he's so pliable is every day they come out with a new thing. And I, I honestly, I, I mean, I know conventional wisdom is, look, and at the end of the day, they'll all come together because they have no other choice. And I guess that's true, but it may not be true. I mean, I think we, we, we think there's 18 or 22 Republican congressmen that represent districts that Biden carried, and I think there are five Democrats that represent districts that Trump carried. And, in you know, you got now Margie Dale Green is trying to make herself into a mainstream Republican or something, and of course— She's the, a moderate. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it, just the guy, Andy Biggs, who's like crazy. You know, we got to put— I don't really get how crazy he is because it's crazy you could ever imagine. But, you know, and you got to remember one thing, repeat after me. The whole House elects the Speaker. The whole House elects the Speaker. The whole House elects the Speaker. If Mitch McConnell, if he gets his 49 Republican senators and he gets 35 and somebody else gets 14, he's he's the leader. Didn't work like that with the Speakership. Works like that for the you know, but Scalise, but it, this could be, they could be, you know, you talk about fun is have multiple ballots choosing the House Speaker, which is a distinct possibility. It is. You know, there's a, an expression actually in football for a receiver that he hears footsteps, namely people behind him who, who might. Well, you know, Kevin McCarthy is hearing combat boots uh, these days. I mean, he is he, he's afraid to look around because he's going to get hit. 
And I don't know if he'll make it or not, but uh, I say this, if he does make it, James, he's going to hear those same damn combat boots every day he is speaker. And, and, you know, there's this thing that we talked about, like, you, you understand it better than me, but if you don't, if you don't have a device where somebody in the floor could bring up a motion to vacate the speaker, they can terrorize mm-hmm. you every day. Every day, every day, you know, day. give it's me a this call. or else. Hell, you understand? They'll do anything right. they can. And again, that's a majority vote of the whole House. So the whole if you House. bring it up and you have four or five Republicans and all the Democrats join, guess what? Chairs vacated. And so, we're going to have uh, a good civics lesson. But, but unlike the Pope, you don't know what they're doing because you just get black smoke at the end of the day. We're going to be able to watch this. Right. No, <laughs> well, it's going to be fun. The Congress, but, but they take the votes and they start speaking. Uh, I, I might have me, you know, like, you know, remember we used to talk about how much we love having the World Series during the day? I might have, you know, real daytime television that I want We to can watch. have watch parties. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You know, before we get there, though, Jess in Houston, Texas, wants to ask you, should Democrats be passing anything in the lame duck session to bolster prospects going into 2024? I, I, you know, I, I'll defer to you a little bit, but I, a, a lot of people said they should, you know, deal with the debt ceiling issue. Uh, it, I almost... Politically, they always lose on that because, of course, they're going to cave it in because they don't have any other choice. Of course, Biden is not going to cut uh, entitlements to, to give them a vote, vote on a death care, uh, on uh, on a debt ceiling. Uh, and I don't think they can pass because of the filibuster in the Senate. You, you, you're still very limited as to what you can pass. You know, you yeah. can just sell House and make them vote on it, but I, I, I defer to you. You're, you're much better congressional. Well, no, I think that it's important to pass the debt ceiling if possible because Republicans will demagogue it next year and they will try to, uh, you know, probably be government shut down. You know, if it's only for a week or two, you know, we've lived through that before. But but we got to understand this is a crazier bunch than we have before. You might have thought the bunch was crazy with Newton Company, and you may have thought it was crazy with the Tea Party Republicans. This group is crazier. And, um, you know, if you do it for a while, you really put the, you know, full faith and credit of the United States uh, at, at, at risk. That could have huge economic consequences. The second thing, and a lot of things I like to see him doing the lame duck child tax credit, some kind of thing for uh, dreamers, the immigration. The other thing that has to be done, though, is the Election Reform Act. That has, you know, at least 11 or 12 Republicans. Uh, and that's the, the protection against some of the stuff that Trump tried to do in 2020. So, you know, I think I think a lame duck uh, could be productive, but, you know, not not much time. I mean, James is right. This was as good a bunch of questions as we've had. And so keep them coming. You know what to do, listeners. You know, hey, if I take a just praise out, listen, I watch like sometimes the cable TV stuff. I look at sites. And some of the stuff that is brought up, it's just vapid, nonsense gold. No one that knows anything about politics would pay any attention to it. And, and literally every question that we got sent in was, was, I thought, on the money, was provocative. It forced me to think about it. You know, it, 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 so congratulations to our listeners, man. We, you yeah. know, Amen. Good. I'll second that. Yeah. Um, you know, we love them. Science tells us that the best way to achieve and maintain consistent, deep sleep is by lowering core body temperature. Temperature controlled sleep repairs muscle after a hard day's work and improves cognitive function. So you can always start your day feeling sharp and alert. And if you haven't heard, Sleep Me is the new home for Chili Sleep, bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offered, but under a new name, Sleep Me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper restorative sleep. Now, Chili Sleep makes the Uller, Kube, and Doc Pro sleep systems. They're water-based, temperature-controlled mattress hoppers that fit over your existing mattress. Now, let me repeat that. They're water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for a deep, cold sleep. Their sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, 
stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through the day. They also just launched the new Doc Pro Sleep System. It has two times more cold power than other models, is whisper quiet, and has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. You can even pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. Now, I know I sleep better than ever. Now, how great are sleep systems for sleeping cool on the Gulf Coast, James? It's indispensable. And, and, and as a bucket load of research, that we talked about this before, uh, that shows that that the temperature, the surrounding temperature has a lot to do with the quality of sleep. And you generally want to be a little cooler at night than you think. And th- this naturally does it to you. I'm, I'm so glad we have these, these 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 products because let me tell you, you and I both know this. It, it, biggest determinant that you can have is how you feel the next day is how you slept the night before. Head over to sleep.me slash war room to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for politics war room listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S-L-E-E-P dot me M-E slash War Room to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. And you also can find the link in our show notes. Now for the outrage of the week. James, Republicans this fall ran on inflation and crime. Now, the House Republicans are clueless on inflation, but they have their crime issue. Hunter Biden's laptop. House Republicans already are salivating over daily, monthly hearings on the laptop. Uh, This week, the supposed expose was Twitter's new owner and Trumpite, Elon Musk, giving selective internal documents with conditions we don't know about to Matt Tabibi, a left-wing journalist turned right-wing conspiracy buff, supposedly showing how Twitter coordinated with the Biden campaign and covered up a New York Post story in 2020 about the damning information on Hunter Biden's laptop. Several points to make. Other news organizations, including the Wall Street Journal, passed on this Hunter Biden laptop story at the time because it needed much more verification. And after a couple days, uh, it was back up on Twitter, the New York Post story. The selective documents show not a conspiracy, but an internal debate at Twitter over how, how to handle a story. That's the same debate that goes on in any news organizations, including the Wall Street Journal. And the Biden campaign did ask Twitter to take down one image. This is the Biden campaign, not the Biden presidency. And that image was pictures showing Hunter Biden's most pornographic private parts. Now, Hunter Biden, I think, is sadly a disturbed guy who traded on his dad's name to make money dealing with nefarious characters. I I do fault the former vice president, especially his staff, for not bringing a stop to this seven or eight years ago. But so far, no serious journalist or watchdog group has shown any complicity on the part of Joe Biden or where he profited financially from any of these shenanigans. And for House Republicans, after brushing aside the most flagrant ethics violation we have ever seen at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue from 2017 to 2021, and speaking of offspring, remember Ivanka and Jared this gives new meaning, James, to Hutzpah. Okay. So a, a friend of mine watched Fox last night, right. and after they called it for Warnock, it was all Hunter Biden all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. Never happened. It's the greatest of the Biden crime. Thing. It's the great. You just, you know, I, I have Republicans, you, you just wait till this whole Hunter Biden thing comes out. I said, okay, I'm waiting. I continue to wait. All right? I, I see that this, this is a guy who's had mental problems, ethical problems, uh, substance abuse, you know, it was in, in some ways a bit, kind of a pitiful figure. It, 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 it is. Nothing to do with his dad, it, you know, anybody, that can happen to anybody, but they just, I, I have no idea where they think this is going to end up. That The Washington Post, that guy, Glenn Castle, I've had issues with in the past, like, but, but he's you know, he exhausted. He said, just look, there's nothing here. Anyway, he walked you through the whole thing. If you're interested enough to do it, you should read that. It, you know, no, you know, no normal person thinks this is anything other than a, a, a guy exercising really poor judgment. 
Uh, yeah, and the Ukrainian prosecutor, James, that, that the vice president did um, encourage, pressure the country to get rid of, was a guy who wasn't investigating corruption and may have been corrupt himself. So, right. Uh, it's it's European Chicago. So, Ray is, I saw last night on, on, on television, several of, of the black commentators were saying how embarrassing Herschel Walker is to black people. And I, I know when, like, somebody from Louisiana does something stupid, I go, oh, God, this is kind of embarrassing. And these Republicans are so cynical, and I give Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump all of the credit that, that they need. They they took this guy who was living in Texas, and they knew what he was, but it fulfilled their idea of what a black person should be, all right? And he's, he's, you know, it might, it might not be his fault. It might be he might have CTE, he might have concussions. He's like childlike in his stupidity. And they did that because they thought it was going to be a big enough Republican year that he would win anyway. Right. And then would have Herschel Walker, who would fulfill every racist person, every racist person's view of how a black person, how black people act. It was the most cynical, disgusting thing I've ever seen. And they used this pitiful man as, as, as a prop to advance their view of what their voters think that black people are. And everybody should be grateful for A, that we lost. And Warnock is an articulate, you know, dignified, thoughtful uh, person who, who doesn't feel fulfill what what they want to believe that black people are. And I, this was a, 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 a disgusting act of the part of these people to bring Herschel Walker from Texas to Georgia and, and put him in a race he had no business being in, that he they knew he was going to expose himself and, and to, to all this loony stuff he said. I thought I, 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 I thought it was disgusting. And I, I agree. I, uh, that that uh, like, you know, you know, understand this at at a very basic level. Yep, couldn't agree more. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, Blinkist, Miracle Brand, and Chili Sleep in the show notes. We thank you for supporting them. When you do, you help make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning. 